Hi, everyone. It's Ryan, the host of Field Trip. This week, Frontline is holding our Insights Summit 2019 event in Orlando. This is an event where school and district leaders at all levels are gathering to share ideas and strategies and learn from each other. And to celebrate, we are re-releasing an episode from last year. Nick Indeglio and John Ross are two of our keynote speakers at the Insights Summit. And last summer, I sat down with them to hear them talk about leadership, technology, professional learning, and how it's all changing in the 21st century. A quick update, I mentioned that you can hear their podcast, The Rockstar Principles, on YouTube. And since we first aired this episode, they've gone back to an audio-only format, and you can find new episodes of their podcast at rockstarprinciples.net or wherever podcasts can be found. I hope you enjoy it. We found that isolation was such a big part of why people were leaving the principalship. Principals feel alone. And we realized, especially for elementary principals, there's one elementary principal in a building usually. They've got no one to bounce ideas off of. And that's exactly what we're all about here on this podcast. Kicking ideas around and sharing stories from school and district leaders who are coming up with new and creative ways to meet the challenges in education today. That certainly made it easier having technology, you know, the the ability to reach out and get feedback from people. This is what I'm thinking. What do you think? The, the ability to hear, to, to follow like-minded individuals and to hear ideas from them. Every other week, we're bringing new stories, ideas, and insights from principals, superintendents, department heads, and educators from all across the country. When John and I started the Rockstar Principles, the whole thing was We just want to all be in this together, and and we'll give you our ideas. Disagree with us. Please tell us. Do do you do it differently? Did Did it work better somewhere else? From Frontline Education, you're listening to Field Trip. This week on Field Trip, we speak not with one principal, but two. My guests are both principals at Downingtown Area School District here in Pennsylvania. In 2013, they started a podcast for principals. We'll include a link in the show notes, or you can go to YouTube and search for Rockstar Principals. My name is Nick Indeglio. I am currently the principal at Downingtown Middle School, which is in the Downingtown Area School District, serving grades 7 and 8. Uh, we've been there for about nine years, which is uh, starting to make me feel a little bit old. Uh, proud to represent the district um, and work with John uh, on a lot of different projects, including our Rockstar Principals podcast. Um, and I was also the uh, 2017 uh, National Digital Principal for uh, NASSP. And I'm John Ross. Uh, I'm also in Downingtown Area School District, Lionville Middle School, again, grades 7 and 8. Uh, a little bit about me, I guess. I, I was a 2009 National Distinguished Principal for Pennsylvania. I work currently, uh, not work, I mean, in addition to, to the work that I do for a living, I work along with other principals in Pennsylvania for the State Principals Association, PA Principals Association, which is an affiliate of NASSP and NAESP, the Secondary and Elementary uh, State Principals Association. So I've also been in Downingtown since 2010. Nick and I both started at the middle middle level in Downingtown at the same time. The two of you host a podcast that some of our listeners might be familiar with called Rockstar Principles. And you know better than anyone that principals already have a ton on your plates. The idea of a 40-hour work week is, I'm guessing, a pipe dream. What made you decide to add a podcast to your to-do list? It was convenience more than anything, right? Yeah. It was out of convenience. Uh, we were, Nick and I live in the same development in the same town. And, uh, We would drive in together on occasion. We would ride into work uh, every once in a while, usually during the summer when things were a little bit more low key and our schedules allowed. And we found that we were, you know, talking about educational topics and we were having really, really good discussion on the drive in and it made the drive go really, really well. And then one day we were just like, man, we should be, we should be recording this. We should be taping this because this is like really good stuff. And Nick was the, being the digital principal that he is. Um, you know, came up with the idea of recording it for a podcast. And we've, we've actually done some segments in our car, but uh, most of the time we record it in one of our two homes. 
Yeah, when John and I started the podcast, uh, and like John said, we were driving in together, uh, having these great conversations, and I was wrapping up my dissertation at that point, like getting ready to defend. And the topic of my dissertation was on longevity and the principalship, uh, focused on the middle level principle, but really applicable to elementary and high school as well. It, it's really, you know, principles are principles, regardless of the level. And we found that isolation was such a big part of why people were leaving the principalship. Principals feel alone. We're middle managers. We're, we're at a level where we're supervising teachers, but we're not at the central office level making uh, bigger picture decisions. And a lot of times you're in the middle of that sandwich where uh, it's not always the happiest place to be. So as the dissertation went on, that's what the research showed, that you know those feelings of isolation were playing in. And we realized, especially for elementary principals, there's one elementary principal in a building usually. They've got no one to bounce ideas off of, uh, anyone else at their level. So as the podcast started, we very quickly discovered that our audience wasn't just going to be principals interested in conversations about the latest educational topics. They just wanted a voice that sounded similar to theirs, could share experiences, could sound the same, basically someone they could relate to. And that's what it turned turned into at first. Our very first episode, uh, we interviewed John's wife, Julie to talk about what it's like being the spouse of a principal. And uh, not long afterwards, maybe a week afterwards, we received an email from a principal in California who told us that had he had our podcast five years prior when he became a principal, it would have saved his marriage. He wound up getting divorced, and the advice that Julie had, and some of the things we talked about, he wouldn't have gone down. You know, he would have made different decisions that would have he felt would have saved his marriage. And that's kind of, for me at least, um, that's when I realized, all right, there's an impact that we can have here on a very specific audience, but uh, you know, an important need to fill a niche. I'm I'm curious as you built this network, as you hear from principals, and and they're telling you the kinds of things that they're getting out of hearing from you, hearing from guests that you're interviewing, what are some of the common themes that you hear from folks, other principals who are really interested and impacted by what you're doing? That's a good question. That's a tough, that's a, yeah, that's a great question. Actually. I mean, it's really, the, the whole thing is kind of a catch-all in that we talk about everything. We don't just talk about being a principal on the podcast. We talk about pop culture, comic books, movies, you know what I mean? We have TV shows. So uh, we've covered a lot of different things. I think most of the feedback that we get from people, topical feedback, I think a lot of it centers around, and I was thinking while Nick was answering, I mean, a lot of it just centers around leadership in general. You can be a leader of a, you know, of a law firm, leading a business, you know, running your own business. It's lonely at the top. There's a reason that that expression is, you know, so true is because it, it when you're the person who's ultimately responsible for things, uh, you're there and you're you're on your own. So a lot of the things we talked about applied across leadership, you know, across the spectrum of leadership, not just educational, I think. Uh, I'll pop in with uh, just three quick examples from the podcast that I think tie in directly to what John's talking about. Uh, the first was we did a segment that was just intended to be a one-off. Like we're going to talk about the way principles are represented in pop culture. So we were talking The Breakfast Club and Ferris Bueller and Simpsons. The Simpsons mm-hmm. um, and how the principles are usually shown to be goofs and, and you know, we're the, they're the butt of the jokes by mm-hmm. the end of it. And the feedback we got on from the podcast response on Twitter, it was phenomenal. Like principals jumped in with all of their examples and TV shows and movies and how they felt about it. And it struck a chord, you know, at that level. That We did two other um, ongoing segments. One was called uh, The Middle School Mafia, and it was advice from The Godfather that applies to the principalship. And we did a little bit of a stretch, a little bit of a stretch, <laughs> but we, you know, we love those movies. Yeah. And we did uh, Rocky's Punches of Perspicat. Perspicacity. That was yours. <laughs> it was a, <laughs> at thesaurus.com. So wisdom from the Rocky movies. And those two, it just it I think it's universal among principals and school leaders, perhaps, or maybe leaders in general. They relate to those types of movies because it centers on themes of, you know, heroism and uh, leadership, whether it's, you know, in shades of gray, maybe perhaps, but mm-hmm. um, that's what the kind of things they connected to. So th- those types of segments that tie into real life or pop culture have usually got us the most. Um, you know, feedback and stories from other people. Did it stop with podcasting or have you found other areas of technology useful in connecting principles to one another? Yeah, I mean, I think when we first started back in 2013 and even before that, we were both pretty active on Twitter and we actually have led uh, a few Twitter chats um, for different organizations. I've had us involved in in, uh, having Twitter chats and I think 
that's something that might be more commonplace now, but when, you know, when we were first getting involved in it, it was something that was newer to a lot of people. A lot of people didn't realize because social media gets a bad rap and people think, oh, social media, you're going to be exposed to all this negativity, but really that there's ways to use Twitter in order to have your own professional development right there in your hand. Yeah. And I would say that to add to that, and although it's not necessarily technological based, um, it led into several ed camps that we participated in and helped lead where, uh, you know, whether it was us doing a live podcast or running sessions there, that it was a networking tool. Um, and we have found recently that uh, while Twitter is still great, it's still, it's, you can't quite get as deep. So in those Twitter chats, eventually they start becoming repetitive mm -hmm. and it's the same thing over and over again. LinkedIn has recently um, become a more uh, palatable platform for a lot of school leaders where you're seeing more blogs, you're seeing more articles and a little bit more in-depth conversation. Um, it's not as easy as Twitter in terms of how quickly you can jump in and find things. Mm -hmm. But I have a feeling that there's a shift kind of occurring that's going to go more in that direction um, as this generation continues to, I hate to even say that generation, you know, mm -hmm. as we're the old guys now <laughs> and younger people coming into administration, that's the platform they're using to find jobs, to network with people. I think that's where we're going to see a lot of the connections. Mm -hmm. Obviously, we don't want to just use technology for the sake of using technology. We have few enough hours in the day, and, and it's great to be spending time with people in our lives. But it, clearly, it's leading to helpful things for you, ideas, things that help you do your work. What are some of the ways that it has benefited you personally in your role, whether it be through the podcast, through social media, through Ed Chats, connecting with principals who are separated by distance? How, how has that helped you out? I, again, go back to Twitter and I get a lot of current research, a lot of articles. There's different other principles that I follow that post things, other ed leaders that we follow that, you know, we'll, we'll get a lot of, we'll get topics for our podcast from Twitter. You know, so I'll be doing something mindless, like standing outside for bus duty, you know, and as the buses are rolling by me, I'm scrolling through Twitter looking to see what's hot, what's going on. So that's one place I get, I go to a lot. I think it's, and I'll give one other example and then a, a caveat to it as well, the uh, Voxer. So it's a very simple app and it basically it is simulating the old Nextels where you used to have the walkie-talkie communication. So a group of uh, principals I was working with um, during the time of the digital principal thing when that was going on, about five of us uh, got into a Voxer group and then we would just literally walkie-talkie each other to kind of put our ideas on paper for a blog we had to do together. Um, so we could have used Twitter, we could have done email, we could have had a text group, but mm -hmm. this was just a quick way to kind of throw an idea out among a very specific group of people separated. We were all across the country. One of us was in Alaska, one guy was in California, we had a few people down on like the Southeast coast. Um, so that was a, another tool, you know, that was just connecting people um, in a different way slightly than Twitter mm -hmm. does. The caveat I would put to that is knowing your audience. So Twitter for educate, for the educational purposes, there's a lot of great stuff there. When we started our school accounts back in 2010, I guess it was, uh, we weren't getting traction quick. And we quickly learned that the parents in 2010, and interestingly, even today, mm -hmm. they're on Facebook. Mm -hmm. So we kind of had to switch, at least at Downingtown Middle School, we had to switch our communication means to get the word out about things we were doing at school to Facebook. And, and Twitter was like a separate type thing. So we have since linked, you know, our Instagram and Twitter and, and a, a little bit of everything. Um, but you have to know where's your, where is your audience? How are you going to most easily be able to connect with them? And I think that's in order to leverage technology, that's going to be a way to you, you got to ask that question first. I'd love to hear any more specific stories that you might have to share about your role as a principal here in Downingtown. What are some ideas that you have have gleaned from people who you've connected with in these ways that have that have really helped you do your job? Well, I would say I would the one person we had on the podcast recently was Ted Dinnersmith, who, who's an author, has uh, published a couple of different books that I have sitting up there. Most likely to succeed, he wrote with uh, Tony Wagner, and then his most recent book, What School Could Be. So we're huge fans of his. It's all stemmed from seeing the documentary um, of Most Likely to Succeed uh, about a year and a half ago. And we eventually got him on the podcast. Um, and, you know, a lot of what he has to say and a lot of what he supports with just building 21st century schools and moving away from the assembly line model and, you know, st stopping the whole mindset of continuing to do things the way they've been done for 100 plus years. You know, we last year... At, at Lionville, did away with final exams and started to work kids toward doing authentic learning projects that we called capstone projects at the end of the year. So now kids spend the year rather than 
cramming information into their head the last two weeks of school and spitting it out on a piece of paper and then forgetting it and never dealing with it ever again. They have this project that they work on all year long that is self-driven and self-motivated. And at the end of the year, they produce, they do a presentation and we have a walkthrough day where everybody has them on display and people get to see what everyone else did. And, you know, those kinds of things, I think a, a lot of what came out of that had to do with connecting with authors online like Ted Dinnersmith and uh, among others. Yeah, and he really helped drive um, not just the ideas, but helped get us, uh, I hate to say um, public approval, but right. some of the things that we're doing now are a little bit revolutionary in that it's not traditional. So getting rid of the midterms and finals. Well, what? wait, we've we've never done that. Like, we need grades. We need this. Well, yeah. You're going to do a what? A year-long project with middle school kids? While John was piloting that, we took our traditional academic awards and eliminated them completely, no academic-based awards, and we gave awards based on respect, responsibility, resourcefulness, empathy, kindness, and caring. Um, so basically changing the focus of what we wanted to be about. At the same time, both schools embraced the notion of 21st century learning and the skills that we know employers are looking for in the 21st century. Now, that research is all over Twitter. It's in those books. It's, 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 that's where technology is giving you the ability to just put that out there and say, so the four Cs, if you look at the edu, edu uh, 21st century, uh, co collaboration, communication, critical thinking, and creative problem solving, those are the skills we want our kids acquiring. So now, by pulling this research in, um, we can win our parents over our community over and our students over to a degree too, as well as teachers, um, to try these new and different ways of learning that are outside the norm. So when you see the capstone projects, um, you know, and you're at the end of the year and instead of kids getting a Scantron back, you know, with a test, we're having, John had three weeks worth of these awesome presentations that kids were showing a passion that they studied for the course, over the course of a year mm -hmm. and had to come up with some type of final product. That's real life. That's project management. That's, you know, that's where we're headed and where, we're, where we've always been. One example of an article, and I don't want to dovetail too far off your question, but uh, recently a great article just appeared talking about the failure of the No Child Left Behind standardized testing movement. And yeah, there were some good things that came out of it. However, the author was basically saying, where are all these amazing kids we produced from the testing error that are now changing the world and affecting the global economy. It didn't have the impact we thought it did. So let's try something different. And if we didn't have access to people like Ted Dinnersmith at, at our hands because of technology and podcasting and, and, the, and YouTube and all these other venues, we wouldn't be able to kind of push the envelope that way. Nick and John said that what they're doing had an impact way beyond just recording conversations and sharing best practices with other principals. These conversations they were having, these ideas they were encountering, they led to somewhat of a seismic shift in how they lead their buildings. Well, there, there's, a, there's an expression that I learned years ago from a mentor principal that I used to work with, and I go to it all the time. And the expression is, the only good thing about banging your head against the wall is it feels good when you stop. <laughs> and... I, for years, was in the data rat race. You know, I was that kind of principal where we're going to track data when every single kid is going to have numbers associated and we're going to be able to, we're going to have this grand uh, matrix-like style uh, system where we're going to know all of these numbers for every single kid. And I think through interactions that I've had between social media and people I've gotten to meet like Todd Whitaker and Ted Dinnersmith and Tom Murray and people that, you know, we've had on the podcast, we had this realization somewhere along the line. I had it when I, when I saw the documentary most likely to succeed a year and a half ago, it, it was I, I, the word cathartic or not, not cathartic, but like transformative, the skies opening and the light shining down. I started texting him 10 minutes into the documentary. Oh my God, what are we doing? We, 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 this is wrong. We're, this is all wrong. We, why are we focused so much? You know, all we do is complain, complain, complain as educators about standardized testing, right? High stakes tests. Oh, it's so awful. We make these kids do these tests, blah, blah, blah. And then we turn around and we give them an hour's worth of homework every night. And we turn around and we make them study for midterms and finals that are totally pointless. And actually research shows do not uh, help with, with learning at all. So we're hypocrites. You know, I had this realization and I felt terrible. Oh, my God, I've spent 
the last couple of years, I'm a total hypocrite. I've talked over and over again about these tests and how terrible they are, and yet I'm doing this willingly to kids. And so it's it's like that, you know, the, not that it's anything close to a 12-step problem, but <laughs> yeah. it's, it's accepting and realizing that you have a problem is the first step, and then beginning to take steps toward, you know, rectifying that. And that's when you start to find and connect like-minded thinkers, right? Because you start to tweet things or you start to you know, contact people through social media, however you want to. And that's the great thing about social media is the ability, you know, to direct message because a lot of them do. A lot of these great thinkers, you can just send them a direct message and they, oh my God, they reply. They actually get back to you, right? It's not something you put in the mail and it takes months to hear back from. So I think it just became this snowball of, all right, we're, we're doing this, we're doing this, we're doing this. And, and the last thing I'll say about it is, you know, when, when, we brought our teacher group together last year. One of the first things one of the teachers said, and it's on the back of our T-shirts. We got our staff T-shirts every year. It's on the back of our T-shirts this year, and it's no turning back. We're not going back. We, we've now, we've seen the documentary. We've read the book. We've all in this building and in Nick's building had this realization that what we were doing wasn't what's best for kids. We're just never going back to that. We're only looking forward and looking for new and better ideas of ways that we can help them with 21st century skills. I think that also goes along with the, the only part I would add onto the way John has kind of like framed everything is that it doesn't happen on day one when you walk into your office at the principal as a principal. You're like you've just gotten the job and you sit down. The research shows that a principal doesn't reach their maximum efficiency and achievement, depending on how you define achievement, until being in the same position for seven years. So And yet the average tenure is about three. Three. Three to five. The average tops. tenure for a principal is three to five. And yet it takes seven years. So where's the disconnect there? Huge disconnect. So we're looking at a, a we're, John and I, and admittedly we're both we have big personalities, and um, we'll, we'll we'll take chances sometimes, <laughs> which isn't always good, but it's not always bad. So after you've built, um, I think the you've built up your credit for long enough. We're past those seven years. We're in year nine, and John's right. It got to a point where, uh, since we're throwing uh, quotes around, um, you know, Nero fiddles why Rome burns. Uh, what are we pushing towards? You know, all these things we're doing. What skills are we our kids actually leaving with? You know, do they know how to actually look at a critical a resource critically and say whether this is good or bad? You look at the news media today, and you and you have li you have your choice. It's not like when mm -hmm. we were we were young, where you had channels three, six, and ten, and you had a balance of some sort. Now you pick your you could have your leftist XM radio show, you could have your right wing radio show. There's not really a middle ground anymore. So how do you vet sources? How do you know what's real and what's not real? And how do you get to a point where you can do those things? What right. we're doing is when we were test prepping, none of that was happening. So it's it's getting to the point where we're like, no more of this. And it's time to do something better. One additional thing I would say about it, and I don't know how much we're you know bird walking your question here, so feel free to, <laughs> this is fine. to edit this out if, if it is. But you know, one of the things I discovered, we discovered last year, um, you know, for years we were spending all this free time we had on PSSA prep. So we have like advisory period during the day, right? And we would do PSSA prep activities. What's the released item we're going to do this week? And what are vocabulary words we need to focus on? And what are, you know what I mean? Text-dependent analysis, all this stuff. Bam, 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 bam. Just hitting kids over the head with it on a daily basis. Okay? Next, last year, we did away with all that. Stood up at back to school night, both of us. Told parents, you will not hear the words PSSA and prep together at all in this school. Because we're not doing it anymore. So we spent a whole year working on building rapport and relationships, working on 21st century skills, working on, you know, helping prepare our kids for what they want to learn. <gasps> God forbid. Right. And what happened? Our scores barely moved. Hmm. So for all those years that we were knocking ourselves dead, doing all this PSSA prep stuff, we did a year without doing any of it, not a single thing. And our scores didn't move at all. So that, to me, reinforces the notion that if I'm going to be spending that time during the day, I'd rather be spending it developing a rapport and a relationship with a kid than making them do this meaningless, pointless work that does nothing for anybody. And to illustrate that very quickly with an example would be uh, we did we abandoned, when we abandoned that test prep at uh, Downingtown Middle last year, one of the things we put in its place was one day a week, a school-wide passion club. 
the teacher, every teacher in the building, including the custodians, picked something they're passionate about, something they really like. And once a week, they would run a 25-minute club with kids who were interested in the same thing. The kids could sign up for that club and get to do something fun the teacher likes. Educational, some of the clubs were. Most of them weren't. But they got to know a teacher outside of the regular classroom environment. Mm -hmm. So um, an example would be one of our French teachers uh, loves cats and did the crazy cat lady club where they made organic cat treats and did things like that. One of our teachers is a, a professional fisherman to the side, did those tournaments you see on TV, mm -hmm. taught kids, you know, good lures and good baits and things to use. Uh, I ran a powerlifting club, so mm -hmm. kids came and learned to weightlift and, and things like that. It, it was fun. It, it was fun. Our scores didn't change. And yet right. kids got to know their teachers better. So what better opportunity to build relationships, which we know research-based is going to lead to better learning. I was going to say, I, I, the last thing I would add to it is that my, I mean, my feeling is, is that when, as we get better at building those relationships, the scores will go up. Mm -hmm. I think that's the only reason they didn't go up is because it's kind of a newer mentality. But my belief is, is that as the longer we entrench ourselves in that notion as that that's who we are as educators. We're about building relationships first and teaching second. The more, the longer we do that and the better we get at doing it, that it's eventually going to lead to a, an uptick in scores as well. I asked if they would have come across these ideas and made these changes if they hadn't had connections with these other principals and experts through things like their podcast and social media. I don't think we'd be as far along as we are. I mean, as I said, it certainly made it easier having technology, having giving the you know the the ability to reach out and get feedback from people. This is what I'm thinking. What do you think? The the ability to hear to to follow like minded individuals and to hear ideas from them on how to do it. I mean, I I, I don't know. It's hard to tell what where we would be, but I'm confident we wouldn't be nearly as far along as we are if it weren't for technology. Essentially, they're using technology as a way to drive their own professional development. And I asked Nick, is the reason they're able to take these ideas and apply them effectively in their schools, is that because they're able to pursue the things that they're passionate about? I'll answer your question before you ask it. Uh, we know, right? The research shows that professional development in isolation is is malarkey. It doesn't work. Right. Um, teachers don't find it valuable when you're throwing canned things at them. So you have to put the option of choice there. Now, we've it's it's forced choice to a degree. I was just talking a minute ago about the you can choose your networks now, you know, like you can go any direction you want. We've chosen a network, you know, so we're focusing and we're we're keying in on people who we feel share the same philosophies to a degree. Um, hopefully not to the point where we're excluding thinking about other things, but you know, uh, I'll give you an example. A Twitter account, um, Alfie Cohn, all right, author who's been around forever, uh, hammers on homework and its uselessness, and there's no research to support homework, right? I agree 100% and always have. So that's that's someone we use from a research basis to kind of like drive home when we're pushing these things. It's so much easier now than it was before. I used to have to pay uh, $700 and travel to New York to see an Alfie Cohn presentation, you know, or wait for the new book to come out, buy the book and read the whole thing to find what I was looking for. Now I can see him on Twitter, get a soundbite, direct message him, and we can get an answer to things. So like John said, the speed at which we can pursue things has become much more rapid and takes the walls down that are in the way of getting there. And it's harder to say no when you have some momentum behind you. And I think that's a lot of what technology has given us. Nick and John said this access to great thinkers across the country is critical, not just for themselves, but also for the teachers in their buildings. Social media enabled them to connect with people in ways that otherwise wouldn't have been possible. They brought in Chris Aviles from Teched Up Teacher to provide training on 101 ways to use the Google Suite, for example. The internet has expanded their reach. They're not limited to finding people within a 20-mile radius. They can connect with experts from across the country. And that way, they're able to take the best ideas that they find. Nick mentioned Dave Burgess's book, Teach Like a Pirate. Yeah, that's the whole the whole concept of uh, Teach Like a Pirate, which, um, again, Dave was, you know, early on Twitter and, and promoted his book that way and was very heavy into the Twitter chats. And the whole idea was, look, I'm not trying to hoard all the ideas for myself. Our network, our community is so that we can all 
help kids. And in the end, that's really what it should all be about. Good instruction, good activities, good ideas. Um, John and I have embraced that. And I think I love our example better than almost any other example. Back before we started at the, our middle schools, the philosophy was everything had to be lockstep between Downingtown Middle School and Lionville Middle School. If Downingtown Middle School did something it couldn't happen unless Lionville Middle School was doing it and vice versa. We've been able to evolve that with these types of networking and seeing how people are sharing ideas and doing things to where John can pilot the capstones. He can work the kinks out while we're piloting uh, school-wide clubs and, and working the kinks out. And then we can share the best parts of it and then steal from each other. And that's really – how else would we get better – if we keep trying the same things lockstep without actually deviating a bit for both of our communities and the differences in our kids and everything like that. And that's what the social media platforms, ed camps, un-PDs, they're you know, calling them now to some degree too, whereas we're just doing things differently and no one is hoarding anymore. You're not locking yourself inside the four walls of a classroom or an office. It's all out there. And people are terrified of this. There's there's definitely a very, very reticent group of whether it's uh, central office groups, and I'm not talking about our district in particular, but just in general where, well, these ideas are my ideas, we're, and we want to be the best, and we want to own these things, and we want to trademark, and we want to copyright. Whereas when John and I started the Rockstar Principles, the whole thing was – we just want to all be in this together, and, and we'll give you our ideas. Disagree with us, please. Tell us. Do, do mm -hmm. you do it differently? Did you have it? Did it work better somewhere else? And we take those things, you know. So that the whole concept, the teach like a pirate. Yeah, we're gonna. We want you to steal from us because we're gonna steal from you. <laughs> right. What is the one thing that you are always trying to communicate to other people when you're connecting with them in in these channels? I just had. I've had. It's funny you ask that question because I've had this conversation twice this week already with people that uh, uh, other principals, and it's the I think it's an Eisenhower quote where you just put put your best people in charge and get out of their way. Mm. You know the the whole the whole idea of our capstone project that we did that was created by teachers. That wasn't my idea. Mm. It's not like I read the book and said, okay, here's what we're going to do. We we all read the book. I took people that were interested and, you know, there were some people who after they started reading and said, oh, I want to be involved. I want to be involved, brought them all together. And I just looked at them and said, OK, what are we going to do? And they were dynamic and motivated and, you know, super smart and just people that really wanted what's best for kids. You know, nobody had ulterior motives. You know, we may have even weeded out a few people that were thinking that there was all people that were doing it for the right reasons. And as soon as I recognized that and realized that, I just got out of their way. And now I'm now they're their own committee in our school. There's there's a capstone committee. P teachers come to me with capstone questions. I say you got to go to the committee. You don't come to me. I'm a consultant. They they you know they'll bring me in if they have questions. If the committee has questions, so there's a lot to be said for you know using your your smart people in your school. And I, I don't think I think that's an untapped resource for a lot of leaders. And I know it's an unta untapped resource for a lot of principals. There's a lot of principals that feel like, you know, this all comes down to me. The buck stops here, which it does. So I have to be involved in everything and I have to know all the details and I have to be, you know, everything has to get run by me. Nothing gets rolled out without my approval. And you, th that's why you're that's why you work, you know, 12 hour days if you're doing that. You know, you hire these people for a reason. You bring them on board for a reason. Use them. Let, allow them to grow. Allow them to flourish. They come up with great ideas. Get out of their way and let them do these things. Since we're using a lot of quotes. <laughs> oh, I'm always uh, about that. You yeah, know, I'm yeah. always doing that. Uh, I guess the two that solidified in me as John was talking about trying to summarize it all, which is hard to do because there's so much. Um, if you don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything. And over the past you know, six years or so that we've been doing the podcast and everything, it, it, I started thinking about just longevity in terms of our own mortality in a career. You know, we work for, let's say, 35 years and very, three to five years is your average tenure as a principal. So decide what matters, what is important, and then put all your energy into, fo into achieving that and to forget all this nonsense that doesn't matter. You know, what matters, what is important. And once you've decided that, and once you've started working towards that, then all the other things we're talking about fall into place. And I'll, I'll end it with this quote, when if you don't tell your story, someone else will. So leverage 
all of your outlets, whether it's social media, technology, your community, and let them know what you're doing. Nick Indeglio and John Ross are both principals at Downingtown Area School District. Nick and John, thanks for taking the time today. It's been really great talking to you both. Our pleasure. Thanks for coming. Again, don't forget to look up their podcast, Rockstar Principles, on YouTube. And if you enjoyed this story, be sure to subscribe to this podcast. You can find Field Trip on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Stitcher, Spotify, and almost anywhere else. Field Trip is a podcast from Frontline Education. Frontline's industry-leading software is designed exclusively for K-12 and is built to help school systems recruit, hire, engage, develop, and retain their employees so they can make the biggest difference for students. For more information, visit frontlineeducation.com slash fieldtrippodcast. For Frontline Education, I'm Ryan Estes. Thanks for listening, and have a great day.